two-minute intro, and then I'll hand it across uh, the panelists for each one of you to do a two-minute, uh, one to two-minute intro as well. Uh, so I'm a partner at IndieBio, which is the world's largest uh, biotech and life sciences incubator. Uh, we've already invested in 159 companies. We're part of the SOSV Accelerator family, which owns Hacks, which is the hardware accelerator. And then we also have Mox, which is mobile. Uh, DLab, which is uh, blockchain, and then China Accelerator, which is uh, China focused. Uh, Mox is now the ninth most active uh, uh, investor in all of uh, India. So uh, we're definitely a global firm, uh, but I'm part of IndieBio, I'm a partner there. Uh, so uh, focused on life sciences and uh, biotech. Um, and to uh, to the earlier, uh, to Marty's point on the earlier panel, so I grew up in San Francisco. I uh, I am definitely, so I actually just moved to New York um, two months ago. Uh, so I've been to several of Marty's panels in San Francisco. Uh, however, I also spent 18 years on Wall Street. 10 of that was in, was in New York. So I am definitely bi-coastal and happy to provi uh, provide some uh, heated conversations on both sides. Um, so with that, um, I'll hand it over, you know, let's go alphabetical by first name. So it's easy for, for all of us to figure out who's going next. Uh, Brad, do you want to go first? Yeah, more than happy to. Uh, nice to meet everybody. I'm Brad Pride, the co-founder of One3 Biotech. Uh, One3 Biotech is not a traditional biotech in the sense of developing drugs by core mechanisms, really using AI to discover new IP, which means identifying targets in the human body and then uh, developing those targets in partnership with pharmaceutical companies, but then developing our own pipeline as well. So we'd say we're one of the few AI in pharmaceutical companies that focus on making predictions and underlying biology. I actually originally started my career off in finance and moved into this arena after realizing, um, well, after first losing a family member to cancer, then realizing that there's huge amounts of um, inefficiencies in drug discovery. Uh, long story short, after selling another company in tech, got right involved in biotech, and here I am making a difference. Awesome. Uh, Eric, is Eric here? Hi, Eric is here. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for my uh, my close up. Okay, uh, there we go. Uh, so my name's Eric Singer. I'm a, a generalist banker who's been in the business a long time. Uh, wandered into biotech about uh, about six or seven years ago, and uh, love the area. And uh, delighted to talk about some of the non venture opportunities and uh, give a perspective. I think you know Marty's uh, uh, given me the chance to. Uh, uh, to, to the extent that people have seen me before, I, I've, I've been consistent in raising money for a company called Neotex. I, I think I first spoke here about uh, five or six years of, uh, about Neotex. It's a, uh, a, a cancer drug company that makes uh, that that has a drug that makes uh, um, cancer look like a bacterial infection. So we kind of fool the body into thinking it's got a bacterial infection, and I'll. Be happy to talk a little bit more about that in the future. I'm with a firm called Bradley Woods as a broker dealer, and looking forward to talking about biotech uh, as we go as it all unfolds. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Shelley. Hi, I'm Shelley Lanning, and I have been a healthcare investor. I've been involved with healthcare my entire career in various aspects from uh, design development, clinical regulatory and the last 25 years with investing. I was a Kaufman Fellow, is one of the original Kaufman Fellow classes and have been at Morgan Stanley private equity groups. And we invest in everywhere from early stage to leveraged buyouts. So I have experience in seed stage investing and in company formation, spinning out from the Mayo Clinic, while Cornell uh, companies in the uh, hospital systems in the Southeast and all the way through liquidity events. I've currently been investing in buying companies myself along with other uh, partners that I have worked with consistently, but my business model has evolved to where I write bigger checks in digital health devices, services, and typically pick one or two of them to spend 12 to 18 months working internally with the company to fill gaps from finance or strategy, even as an interim CEO. Um, and uh, th there you go. That's great. Uh, we, we definitely need more people like you. Uh, Wendy. Hi, this is my first experience with all of you. My name is Wendy Bronfin. I am co-founder of Homeo Lux. Um, my partner co-founder, I think, is in the room with you guys. 
there while I'm here virtually. Um, Homeo Lux um, is, a, uh, is a health tech company. Um, everything we do is mission driven to help families who are battling Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we're a wellness company, we're a consumer product company. Um, we're hardware led and software driven. So kind of think of us like the Peloton for brain health. Um, and everything, as I mentioned, we do is mission driven to, to attack this Alzheimer's disease problem. I know you guys were recently going through a list of all the big areas to invest in. We're very focused on silver tech and the silver tsunami and that audience's um, desire to both prevent cognitive decline, but also to deal with all of the challenges of cognitive decline that, that exists in their day-to-day -day lives. So I mentioned we're hardware led, we have a, um, a light therapy product in the market today. We're scaling up and growing. And um, we plan to launch a content platform that supports all aspects of brain health and wellness. That's great. Um, so I'm gonna open up with a, a very broad topic to, to, that everyone hopefully can relate to, which is, you know, um, we've hopefully are at the tail end of, of COVID. Um, any changes that you see in, in the general biotech world and what major trends do you see as a result of quarantine or you know just in general uh, the age that we're in? Uh, Brad, do you want to start us off? Yeah, you're more than happy to. Um, so specifically in biotech, not health tech? Biotech or health tech, whichever yeah. angle you want. So I think I, I would focus just based on the space that we play on biotech, because um, I think COVID had a huge impact on the acceleration of funds that we've seen available uh, across the, the broad spectrum. Because leading up until COVID, uh, there was about two decades of decline in biotech because there's a huge amount of risk. Um, I mean, that yeah, there's gigantic payoffs, right? But if you put a sharp ratio to that, it looks like a very unappealing investment. And um, what we did start to see in about 2011 is companies coming in, utilizing data, to decrease that failure rate. Now, afterwards, uh, after COVID, there is a large global inflation of um, investment in traditional biotech, but then also within these companies that are utilizing data to decrease the failure rates within biotechs. And we've seen just kind of very early uh, funds become accessible. Um, a couple of examples I can think of is just Inveta, where they raised 51 million recently. They're using AI and chemistry. Adam Wise, 123 million, and Silico, 225 million. Even exits, so seeing recursion, IPO at 5 billion. Velo uh, Therapeutics, which actually did a, a $15 billion SPAC, and they were partially funded by the people who supported Moderna. And then uh, acquisitions like Silicon by Rovian. And that's personally just in the VC space. So we're going into an A series from traditional biotech investors. They're now looking for. Um, companies to, you know, help them accelerate their process and seeing that there's great success and interest in the space. We're actually having companies reach out to us where before AI and drug discovery is almost taboo, like it hasn't been proven out yet. Now we're seeing there's a large amount of interest. Um, and now also on the kind of partnership side for us, because there is more funds going into pharmaceuticals and traditional biotechs, looking for ways to get involved in this type of technology, we're getting a lot more people looking out and seeing this is kind of a mandatory thing they need to adopt. So it's been definitely really interesting. We actually, we're quite early stage. We're even approached for an acquisition, which was extremely exciting, but just feeling confident about growing. Wonderful. Uh, Eric, any trends or any, you know, COVID takeaways? Well, um, uh, my, my big takeaway is just my advice to uh, younger people. I, I got a chance to uh, get much more involved in this industry around 2015, 2016. And I'm just struck by, uh, uh, as, as maybe one of the elder statesmen here, I'm, one, I'm struck by things I wish I had known uh, uh, 35 or 40 years ago. Number one, uh, uh, I think COVID has, has kind of reaffirmed uh, biotech and healthcare's uh, tax-favored status. You know, so you, you can have uh, you can have ups and downs in an industry, but if you if you get a tax blessing in the United States, <laughs> that goes a long way towards uh, having superior uh, personal returns on, on capital. And I think the other big, t the other big concept in healthcare is not, sometimes you have to uh, take a, a step back in, in healthcare and, and think about it. I, I came of age in, uh, back, at, back at the time in college when the, the great exit out of the, middle, out of the middle class into the upper middle class was to become a doctor. And, and uh, as a result, you, you had 
the school I went to, 85% of the incoming freshman class was pre-med. And uh, there was one guy who, who was very, uh, he's a little bit avaricious, very, very smart guy, but I asked him, well, why do you want to become a doctor? He said, I want to become a doctor because I know how much value added it has. I want to be a heart surgeon. I want that guy open on the table, and I want to ask him, okay, how much does, will, will you pay me to sew you back up? <laughs> and and uh, I, I just think the world is, getting, is consistently getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier, and the relative value of being able to add those last few years is going to continue to climb. So those are kind of the two big trends I would, I would uh, talk about to uh, um, somebody in my kid's generation. Awesome. Uh, Shelley. Definitely, I would say remote patient monitoring, the ability to trend towards more frequent contact points with the patient in between visits. And that com uh, combination with using software and AI for decision support so that physicians and care teams can track the, the progress a patient is making, or maybe if they're having a step setback, and utilize the highest level of someone's degree or pay grade within an organization and track what the patient's doing, monitor them, and take the riskiest, most costly patients that multiple comorbidities and allow them to have a bigger touch point, a bigger impact. There's a lot of data out there that shows that regular touch points, engagement, patient increases patient ownership of their disease, their disease process and outcomes and it allows for a much more inexpensive way of, of doing that. We, we've been, uh, a second point to make is COVID highlighted obesity and the dramatic impact that obesity can have on outcomes. We all knew that. We're a heavy society that's growing heavier by the, the minute, I guess. But with over 200 million uh, clinically obese patients that have a very difficult time, the remote monitoring, patient engagement has had a positive impact with highlighting multiple comorbidities and how they can be treated. And Wendy. Yeah, um, I think what we saw mostly in the consumer uh, spectrum is that COVID, uh, as well as highlighting uh, uh, these comorbidities, comorbid comorb <laughs> like obesity, really, we saw a lot of separation between senior citizens, older people, and care, their caregiving children. So th that that highlighted a huge uh, need. A couple things: one, um, children reunited with their parents after a year or so were able to recognize cognitive decline that may have been creeping in slowly over time, but when you have a chasm of that much space between seeing each other, um, and it also highlighted the need for connected caregiving, right? So there's, and the prevention of cognitive decline. So all of that coming together um, really dramatically impacted our customers, unfortunately, because of the increase of the um, awareness of cognitive decline and the incidence of cognitive decline. That's, that's bad news for us. It's good news uh, in terms of our ability to sell into that audience. There's, um, the, the preventative healthcare tech services business is, is expected to grow to, some, to more than $200 billion um, by 2024. And if we're targeting this silver tsunami audience, um, there are, uh, I think, almost 74 million baby boomers that are aging into the retirement age right now. And three, three out of four of them say that they want to age in place, right? All the news about the horrible things that were happening um, early on in COVID in um, senior centers made most people just secure in their decision that they didn't want to end up in a place like that for whatever risks were coming ahead. So uh, Shelly mentioned this need for um, data mining at home and connecting care at home and it, it will that will happen both on the healthcare side of things but also on the wellness and consumer product side of the of the market um, and also uh, just to provide some color because I see uh, sort of life sciences and biotech across uh, many different applications. Um, so IndieBio New York uh, so IndieBio we've invested in 159 uh, startups 
but SOSV, which owns IndieBio uh, across hardware, software, and uh, um, blockchain, uh, has invested in over 1,200, so 1,200 companies. So we've seen a lot over the last, you know, uh, close to a decade. Um, I'd say that, you know, when uh, lockdown first happened, we were definitely freaking out, right? How do we do this uh, biotech accelerator thing remotely, right? Um, you know, you can definitely program remotely, but you need a lab to do wet lab research, right? And so uh, so our last cohort uh, last year uh, was actually completely 100% remote. We did everything over Zoom and uh, each startup had their own uh, lab space remotely wherever they lived, right? And so, uh, but surprisingly, I would say that, you know, 70% uh, of the startups immediately got funding right after demo day. And then six months after demo day, all except one company got funding which is exactly on par with our track record. So there's been, you know, I've been so impressed by how adaptive our founders have been. Um, you know, a couple of examples that, you know, we had founders. Um, so our current cohort, 70% uh, of them, uh, of the founders found a way to get to New York and to do the program in person versus last year was 100% remote. And, um, you know, these founders are just ingenious. So they cannot fly directly to the US, but they found that there are certain countries where you can have a two week stay and, you know, make sure that you don't have, you don't test positive for COVID and then get into the US. And we had three founders do that, right? <laughs> three different, uh, uh, you know, landing spots in the middle. Um, so, you know, it just, uh, it's a testament of how creative and brilliant our founders are. And there was definitely a shortage in pipette tips uh, that people have, might've heard about. Um, we've had founders that, you know, uh, begged and borrowed from uh, their friends in Singapore, uh, in India, and this is earlier in India, um, but uh, you know, every, every problem that came up, they found a solution. I'd say that in terms of investment trends, there's been a renewed focus um, you know, at picking up in demand that was already there in future food, biomaterials, and clean tech. Um, I think clean tech just because that's where you know the world is headed, but also I think um, you know, quarantine highlighted the importance of supply chain and also what we're doing to the world and you know how how unsustainable we basically need five Earths of resources to, su to sustain the population growth that we have right now. Um, I think the other uh, trend that I've seen is that um, there's, so much, there's so much innovation on sort of uh, development of antiviral <laughs> uh, 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 and therapeutics. Um, more so, I've seen so, so our application, our acceptance rate is 1.7%. So we see a ton of companies, a ton of applications every year. Um, I'm interviewing applicants every day, but sometimes three times a day. Um, and so uh, we see a lot of applications in, um, in, in sort of uh, virus-free technology. Um, so the scientists are really starting to figure out, you know, there are things that we're doing in our process that needs to be updated and changed. So all, all positives to uh, Shelly's earlier point about what are the positive pandemic impacts. Um, so I am actually going to go um, sort of uh, deep dive into every panelist uh, focused area, if that's okay. So I know Brad, you're definitely taking the AI angle. So I actually finished all 16 courses of deep learning.ai so I can program <laughs> in machine learning. So one of the things that I was super curious about is that, you know, you can't really patent a, an algorithm, right? And so what, what, how do you answer the whole IP question? Uh, especially when so many companies are getting so much money right? Is your differentiator uh, data or, you know, what is it? Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question. And I think when I was originally speaking about IP, I was thinking about IP that we're actually generating for, um, you know, within drug discovery. So identifying a target and having a target package with the drug. But then our own personal IP, what we do is we patent at what we call the module level, which is kind of a series of best practices and processes that we apply to a multitude of different algorithms. Since a lot of algorithms are kind of, as you said, unpatentable. Um, how we differentiate beyond that, which is really our process that we patented at, you know, solving particular problems or identifying you know, a biomarker, which is, you know, genetic mutation that would may make a, a patient either more perspective or more resistant to a drug. Um, we also do, yeah, we aggregate a lot of data. So, you know, data became a lot more available um, as time passed. I think 2014, we sequenced the human genome. And since then, you know, not that that was the only catalyst, but there's many others that just made data uh, wide variety available. But pharmaceuticals moving relatively slow, they didn't adopt practices to absorb this data. So we have created a database for not only publicly available sources, but also data sources that we have acquired. Um, and we've captured it in a way that we can analyze across a multitude of different data types. So um, when first AI first came into drug discovery, we've seen a lot of people focus on certain data 
types, but not a multitude of different data types. That's what really helped set us apart is the fact that we aggregated this, we ingested this, and then we have our, you know, our best practices, our processes, our patented technology that has the ability to effectively analyze this data. And we do heavily focus on those methodologies to predict the underlying biology and drug discovery. So understanding what best patient um, to target your drug towards based on what the drug is hitting. Um, we identify what it would be hitting and then what indication types or what cancer type uh, it would be most efficacious against and other things such as toxicity challenges. I would say that's a key differentiating factor that we've been able to wow. identify as a value add so far. Got it. So are you screening for targets or drugs? Uh, both, but primarily targets, uh, links to indications, but what we'll do is we'll identify drugs that are repurposable for those targets. So drugs that already exist for a different um, uh, reason, and then we'll have, um, you know, identify if a method of use patent is available. So it might be a drug like, ridiculous example, but Advil, we might find that that's going to target, uh, you know, a lung cancer. That would never happen, but you kind of get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. It's really smart, right? Because it's a fast path to revenue for, uh, for pharma companies. Yeah, uh, de-risk some of that front costs because then you can skip usually into phase two, which saves you yeah, millions. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so Eric, um, I'm actually, I, I'm always talking to scientists, whether it's professors, postdocs, or grad students, and I, I don't always point them to IndieBio because I think some projects are probably better for uh, for grants or for, you know, uh, for BARDA or for NIH. Uh, so I appreciate that you offer the opportunity to talk about university opportunities or non-venture back opportunities. Well, I very much appreciate that. And, uh, um, uh, you know, Gwen, I'm a little bit at a disadvantage when I'm talking to you because I, I don't have quite the same uh, immunotherapy background. I, I like to think of myself as maybe the Mark Twain of immunotherapy. Um, uh, the, the, the two opportunities I just want to mention to the audience is, number one, it, uh, uh, away, from the, away from the venture community, there's a lot of intellectual property tied up in the universities of the world. Uh, and they are now trying to find ways, uh, sometimes within the venture community and sometimes uh, 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 without the venture community, to make sure that their professors have a chance to uh, get the commercial value or some of the commercial value of their, of their IP. So one of the deals that I'm working on is a deal involving a company called Petrogen, where Yale University and, that, and I, NIH gave us intellectual property for preventing periodontal disease. And we've been raising money for that company so that, um, so that, that the, the professor who understood the enzymology behind periodontal uh, disease uh, can have a payday in that area. The other thing that's really kind of been uh, a, a labor of love for me is, is Neotex, which is a, a, a cancer drug company that I mentioned early on. Um, and I, I think one of the big opportunities in a world that's awash with data is the chance to go back and ask yourself the question, what mistakes were made when this drug was looked at by the industry? Uh, we now know, for instance, that thalidomide is a horrible drug for, for pregnant, pregnant mothers, but a spectacular drug for a wide, for wide variety of people with other illnesses. Um, it, with respect to, to uh, Neotex, th this is something that, that would have been this company and this drug was completely invisible to the venture community uh, up until maybe uh, 30 seconds ago because uh, they had had a, 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 remember what we do is we attach a fragment of staphylococcus to the surface of tumors, but the company that, that originally developed this drug had a very big public uh, uh, phase two, three failure and uh, in combination with interferon alpha. And when that was... Uh, and when you bring that to, to the, the uh, as one of the earlier panelists said, when you bring that to the venture world where they, these guys have gone upscale and they're more PE and they're risk adverse, it, it, the problem with investing in a company that's had a, a, a large phase two failure is um, drugs fail all the time, but if, but if it, it, it had a visible failure, there's a chance for the venture firm to not only be wrong, but to look stupid. And that, that's perceived as bad for business. What I like about that is that that means that's a completely overlooked area. The other thing about our particular drug is that uh, for a long time, the drug had a reputation as not having single agent activity. Uh, uh, and we've now gone back and interrogated the data from their, their original trial. And it turns out that in lung cancer, 
uh, non-small cell lung cancer, uh, the single agent activity for chemo is 13%. The single agent activity for, um, uh, for uh, checkpoint inhibitors is 26%. And the single agent activity for our drug looks like it was 42%. So we think we have a tiger by the tail. We recently, and we're starting to do uh, clinical trials in Israel. We recently took a pancreatic patient and uh, who was a stage four with metastasis to the liver. We completely cleared them of tumor and they've been tumor free for, for uh, uh, 16 months. And um, uh, we're doing a, we think we're gonna be in registrational trials next year, uh, doing a basket trial for patients that have a 3% chance of survival <laughs> using checkpoints. And we also think our drug may give CAR-T uh, the chance to work on solid tumors, which would be a very, uh, a, a very big impact as well. So. Um, in, in a nutshell, that's, that's, uh, that's been my focus, and I'm delighted to talk with, with anybody. We've been able to uh, get uh, one of the mega founders of, uh, of, tech, of the tech world uh, to invest and, and re-up, and he's re-upping again, and we're looking for people who want to invest side-by-side side with him. So this might be too detailed of a question, but uh, what is, what's the mechanism of action of the, the drug that you're talking about that enables CAR-T to work on solid tumors? Well, the mechanism of action is that, is that we have a super antigen, and uh, the super antigen is a fragment of staph. It's the most dangerous bacteria that the body can see, and it, obviously it's a fragment, so it can't reproduce. But the, uh, uh, the presence of staph boosts the immune system, and when the staph is present in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the cloning process, those T cells are much more potent. Very cool. Um... I'll definitely catch up with you afterwards. Um, so, yes. Shelley, can, I quote you, can, can I quote you on very cool? What? Can I quote you on very cool? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, Shelley, you mentioned uh, digital health. This is actually an area I struggle with uh, when it comes to investing. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, I always think about, you know, is this reimbursable versus the social aspect uh, because engagement always falls off after a while. Uh, how do you think about, you know, investing in digital health? How is it, how are the companies differentiated? And, you know, just let us know how you view uh, investing in that space. So one of the things that I like that Brad said, I'll just make a parallel here, is he said they like to take drugs that re, re, um, provide a different application. There's a lot of ways that we can take something that's pretty known and how it works and make it more digital. And so there are several ways to get reimbursement from it. There's some new codes that have come up that allow for billable time spent. They, you have to can show the time that you've talked talk to the patient and engage with the patient. And so software can be specialized in order to capture that from behind the scenes. So for example, in the obesity company that we're funding, we're doing a first close this week actually. And we can capture all of the data on the backside. And while Cornell can then go in and have billable events each month with reimbursement codes that are given within five. But within healthcare, a large part of the value driver is with value-based reimbursement. The Medicare, Medicare Advantage, private insurers, they want to see that they're looking from a holistic perspective on patients and doing patient, whole patient care. How do you treat somebody's comorbidities, their obesity, their diabetes, their hypertension, their chronic kidney disease, their, their all, all of the above? And how do you then get reimbursed at a rate that has an impact on outcomes? And this driven, it's driving in the whole entire industry to look not only at how do you have a billable event, but also at outcomes. And that is very difficult to do because so many of the legs of the octopus within the healthcare system don't even touch each other, talk to each other very effectively. And yet their reimbursement is tied to and required. So the obesity company that we're, we're talking with, they not only allow for regular interactions with the patients where they may or may not fall off, but we have relationships with, well, Cornell, New York Presbyterian, Mass um, General, Geisinger, HCA, for example, and they're able to help do pre-planning for surgical, then post-planning for surgical that directly impacts value base, 
They're able to work with employer groups that will help incentivize their employers. So that a union, for example, which is self-insured to help patients be more engaged and lose weight. And even, it doesn't have to be a, I'm, I'm now skinny type of lose weight. It can be a, I just moved three to 5% of my body weight reduction, which has a dramatic impact on drugs and risk profile. And insurance companies and payers track that. What is your risk profile? What is the statistical number? And can I reduce it by small pieces, which have, it's almost like the log linear relationship. It's not directly correlated, but it has a hockey stick impact on risk outcomes and cost. So what I like to do is to work with entities such as the Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic or Wild Cornell, pick companies that are piggybacking off of software or devices in a similar way that Brad does with drugs and be able to reapply. Here's what Preventive Solutions did in their remote monitoring. How can we do that very specifically for fetal and maternal care? How can we take that information and apply it with a patient basis that can then help with measure their outcomes and help with reimbursement? So I think, I think you have to be able to understand the bigger picture and is, but it's very really complicated to have the reimbursement partnerships that are critical in order to have key opinion leaders keep buy-in from payer and providers and then the reimbursement payer partners. Um, super interesting. I think you already answered my next question, which is I have seen the whole, you know, outcome based reimbursement uh, talked about for uh, probably the last decade. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's been implemented to varying degrees, depending on, you know, which uh, which specialty you're talking about. So is the is the trick to investing here that, you know, you're essentially replacing higher cost labor with software or with programs uh, versus trying to establish your own sort of efficacy? proof? Well, I, I hate to say it, but it's both because for while Cornell, for example, they care a lot about outcomes, but there's a 12 month backlog to get into the comprehensive weight control center. There's only 4,300 trained obesity specialists in the United States. I have never seen such an imbalance in supply and demand in all of my career of investing in healthcare. And it's only been recently in the last few years where obesity wasn't a social, you calories in, calorie out. That's the way it was thought of. Now it's thought of as a chronic disease. So you wanna be able to have this, how can you attract the patients who want to come? It's reimbursable by your insurance in most cases and they're self-selecting. I failed or I'm not interested, or I cannot do whatever the social side of it is, and I'm not a candidate for bariatric. That's the largest part of the bell curve. How do you do something for that patient population to reduce risk? So they're sometimes self-selected in what, in what they're doing. So I like to partner with groups that have a drive for whatever their reason is, whether it be outcomes or cost or, or attracting and maintaining what their employees wanna do. So they have lots of different reasons why it, it may work, but we're doing a lot of pilot studies, a lot of work to show impact on drugs, impact on risk variants for insurance. We're doing pilots within fetal and maternal health or within kidney, but we're also looking at population-based studies to show if you can maintain even a 5% weight loss over 12 months, we have excellent data and why. There's lots of drivers around why. Very cool. Um, so Wendy, um, one of the topics that you're probably an, ex an expert on is, you know, the differentiation between health tech, consumer tech, and wellness. Do you want to elaborate on that? Oh, boy. Well, yeah, and it's interesting as, as we're talking about IP and all of this, too, um, biotech investors help hate the answer that I give around IP, which um, is that uh, for us, what we do at, at Homeolux is we, we fast track scientific research, right? So you all know that, and, and Shelly just referenced this too, it takes years and years to develop uh, solutions. Um, Brian knows it as well. It takes 10 years to get FDA approval on something. But what, what we do is we watch what's going on in the brain science world. What are, what are emerging bodies of research that are coming up that can't make it out of the lab? 
um, but the consumer demand is there now. And that's what, that's what we're doing at Homeolux. So we, as, we, as I mentioned, we have this light therapy that um, leverages the ongoing research today in labs at MIT and Georgia Tech and other leading brain health institutes that say, look, 40 Hertz lights is being proven to improve brain health. That's wonderful. And in 10 years, MIT and other brain health institutes will come out with some um, light therapy device that will somehow make its way through the medical system. And when I look at that journey of, you know, when do I first decide that I'm experiencing cognitive decline? When, if ever, am I diagnosed with Alzheimer's? Um, will my doctor recommend this light? And at that point, is it too late? Because the research is showing that it's really a preventative tool. So the, 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 the health tech market is, is, can take advantage of some of these um, issues that the biotech um, and medical tech world can't. Um, the truth of the matter is you can't patent 40 Hertz light, which is what this is. You can have design patents on it. You can do a, a big brand play and become the consumer brand for brain health. Um, and so that's what we're doing. Um, there's, you know, there are a lot of people who aren't comfortable in that world. There are a lot of people who are. It's, they're, they're, there's a chasm of differences between the investment appetite for both of those things, the investment profile for both of those things, and, you know, where you put your investment in. And at the same time, um, so that's, you know, those are those big chasms. At the same time, because we're so mission driven about what we're doing, I'm dying to talk to Eric and Shelly because um, there are people who are doing this kind of research all the time. It takes millions of dollars to create a, a solid, reliable piece of hardware for brain health research. We've got the hardware, we're not the researchers. So um, just as a side thing, we would love to um, partner up with, with anybody who wants to, we'll, we'll donate lights um, to help you know, speed up some efficacy testing on, and research that other folks are doing. Thanks for that. Um, so uh, I know Marty likes to stay on, on, on time, so I'm going to ask each of the panelists to think about, you know, what is, what does the world look like in three to five years? And what's that, what's one trend that you believe in that the rest of the world is underappreciating, right? So I clearly believe that uh, the world is running out of resources, both in, you know, personal health, uh, human health and planetary health. Um, you know, what's, what's one thing that you think will happen in five years that is underappreciated right now? So two sentences, so then we'll close out, uh, or you know, uh, half a minute to one minute uh, each, uh, we'll close out the panel. Brad, do you wanna go first? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's gonna be towards what I'm involved with just because I got involved in personal reasons, but I, I do think, uh, I think it's crazy to think that the level of how barbaric chemotherapy is that we just see that as normal medicine now an absolute necessity because we don't really have the cures. And I think it's in large part due to the fact that there's a lot of good solutions to cancer out there. It's just a very diverse group of diseases and uh, it's extremely arduous and difficult to get through clinical trials. So I think in the future we'll have, you know, that being the end point, much better solutions to certain cancer types uh, and due to increased efficiencies in drug discovery. And I think we are seeing companies affected um, you know, raising capital because they just demonstrated the ability to increase that, um, well, decrease the failure rate, increase the success rate at a much higher amount. And that's you know, why I got here. I, I think there's just in cancer low, 9.6 million people dying every year. So just last year, that was the amount. I just don't think that needs to happen anymore. I think all the data is available. It's just about accessing it and utilizing it in a way that makes sense to, to change. That's great. Uh, Eric. I, I hate to say it. I, I just had to, uh, I, basically, I'm just going to say me too to the, to the prior panelists. Uh, I, I, I think that we're making a lot of progress on cancer. I think that the, the data is available to constrict it. I think that, we under, that we're having a, uh, an ongoing understanding of how the immune system really works and getting more of a holistic approach to the immune system. So I think, uh, uh, I, I think when it comes to cancer, I think that we can increase on our longevity. Unfortunately, I think that uh, uh, I think one of the things that's underappreciated is some of the non uh, uh, non science aspects of longevity, and um, I'm I'm a little bit concerned that the United States is going to head the way of the Soviet Union in terms of overall long, overall longevity, uh, where there was a collapse in the Soviet Union, and I'm I'm a little bit worried about that. 
equal portions of the United States. Uh, not a collapse, but uh, I, I think that uh, 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 it's underappreciated what can happen to us on, with a population decline. I'm concerned about the ramifications of that. That's great. Shelley. So I think it's going to be very bittersweet as people become more and more attached to t taking ownership for part of their own health. So it's what Wendy's saying. I am not going to wait for my doctor. I'm going to go ahead and do this on my own. I'm going to take a personal uh, approach to losing weight or my risk factors. But as that continues to gain momentum, it is going to, I believe, leave a fair number of people behind because Medicare and Medicaid are not going to keep pace. So social determinants of health and uh, just demographics within certain populations, I think are going to fall to the wayside at a faster pace. And so they'll have a bit more of the, this is really great and working really well. And on the other end of the spectrum, like, oh no, now what do we do to help that? So thinking ahead along those lines will be helpful, but as a real small, as any entrepreneur knows, you can't cover the entire spectrum right away. And so it'll provide a bigger gap, which will just cause a requirement to, to for, insurers and providers to think think about that dynamic. And Wendy. Yeah, I, you know, um, Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in America. It's an economic disaster in the making. So it, it disproportionately affects women, both as, as a disease, but also as caregivers and pulling them out of the workplace as caregivers. It disproportionately affects people of color um, and yet we know that one third of cognitive decline is preventable. So I think that the trend that I hope we all, we all see is that people start living brain healthy lifestyles and habits in this preventative health.